guard the good deposit entrusted to you by the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Guarding the deposit of faith is the mission which the Lord has entrusted to his church and which she fulfills in every age. This treasure, received from the apostles, has been faithfully guarded by their successors. All Christ's faithful are called to hand it on from generation to generation by professing the faith, by living it in fraternal sharing, and by celebrating it in liturgy and prayer. The Catholic Church, as you know, has a creed, or is very proud of our creed. We have the Apostles' Creed, which is generated from the Twelve Apostles, and then from the Council of Nicaea, we have the Nicene Creed. And that's a creed that you may be most familiar with because we pray that creed in the context of Sunday Mass. And what that creed really confesses is two basic foundational truths that are in the Catholic Church. And the first truth is the mystery of the Holy Trinity, that God is three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we revere Him when we pray that prayer prayers to praise to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and then church. And in the context of the creed, we also reverence God's plan for creation. And that's the Paschal mystery, the salvation of the world. St. Paul would refer to that part as the plan of the mystery. The patristic tradition calls it the economy of salvation. That's kind of a nebulous kind of a phrase, the economy of salvation. What does it mean? It refers to God's plan for our salvation. This plan was accomplished principally by the Paschal mystery of Jesus Christ. What is the Paschal mystery? That too is kind of nebulous. It's like it's a mystery. It's the life, death, resurrection of God, Jesus Christ, and then his sending of his Holy Spirit into the world. So all those points kind of all taken together, the, the passion of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the ascension of Christ, and then the sending of the Holy Spirit. We call that whole meld of truth the Paschal Mystery. And that's how God accomplished his plan of salvation. So we the faithful, we celebrate that whenever we pray the Mass and we have our other liturgies, Mass being the pinnacle sacrament. And so what do we do from that? We live from it and then we bear witness to the world. In my church I always say let's stand and profess what it is we believe and then we unite our voices and we pray together our creed. This is what we believe. So if anyone asks us on the street, what do you believe? If we just said the creed, there would be a great synopsis of everything in the context of what we believe, what we call the articles of our faith. You may have heard a beautiful song. The song is, we remember, we celebrate, we believe. And that is a powerful song, because it is truly what we are. We remember by professing what we believe. We remember, and then we celebrate what we believe, and then we believe. It deepens our belief. We remember. The words of the song are, we remember how you loved us to your death, and still we celebrate that you are with us here. And we believe that we will see you when you come in your glory. You've died, and yet you're still with us. And we look forward to the day that we can really see you face to face. That's beautiful. The Christian mystery, it is a mystery. God is a mystery. And we participate in that mystery in the liturgy. Well, what does the word liturgy mean? It comes from a Greek word, liturgia, and it originally meant the public work. What we would say now is that it means the work of the people. Liturgy is the work of the people. We are the people. Really, it's the work of God, and we participate in that. God goes first, and we participate in the work of God. Actually, in John's Gospel, we have this great uh, saying of Jesus, I glorified you on earth, Father, by accomplishing the work that you gave me to do. And he did, redemption. He was sent to redeem the world. And then we participate in that redemption every time we invest ourselves and participate in the liturgy. The New Testament refers to liturgy as the celebration of divine worship. What do we worship? God alone. God who is divine. None other do we worship but God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But also liturgy refers to the proclamation of God, the proclamation of the kingdom of God. Our Holy Father of happy memory, John Paul II, added that beautiful mystery to the rosary, the third luminous mystery. And I can just see Jesus on top of Mount 
and he's proclaiming the gospel of God. And that's what we do when we have the liturgy. We proclaim again and again the gospel of God. What place does the liturgy occupy in the church? Many different dimensions of this. First of all, as a source of life. The liturgy is a source of life for all of us. The liturgy manifests the church as a visible sign of communion in Christ between God and men. We can still not see God. We won't see him till he shows himself at the end of time when he comes in glory. And yet the liturgy allows us to have a little foretaste of God. It allows us to participate in the uh, coming union that we will have with God. So the church right now is the visible sign of our communion between God and man. It must be preceded, though, by a couple of things. Evangelization, which is so important, you know, to spread the good news. There are so many people that don't know God. They don't know that there is something after death. They don't know God's plan, the economy of salvation. And from that, then, there is the seed of faith. Um, when we are baptized, our souls are infused with faith, hope, and love, uh, the three theological virtues. And so foundational to celebrating and believing would be the gift of faith. God freely gives it. It's his gift. And then conversion. And that's kind of a lifelong process. It's what our hearts do over and over again as we fall more and more in love with God. And then we um, leave behind our selfish intentions and we participate in the selflessness of God and we produce good fruits. Another place that the liturgy occupies is that of prayer. On our um, Catechism of the Catholic Church, there are four parts to this particular presentation of what we believe, all of the teachings in the area of faith and morals. And the whole fourth part is really a depiction of prayer. And the very prayer that is concentrated on and kind of focused on is the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father. And so that was Jesus' guideline on how we are to pray. That's how we approach the Father in the Lord's Prayer. And we demonstrate its importance by including the Lord's Prayer in the context of the sacred liturgy, the Mass, as well as in other liturgies, such as the liturgies of the hours. And we pray the Our Father is uh, ordained three times at least a day, and if we pray the rosary, it's more than that. And so the liturgy is also, the prayer liturgy, is also a participation in Christ's prayer. Every time we pray that prayer, we're praying the very prayer that our, our Lord showed us to pray when he prayed to the Father. And then as far as catechesis, we would say that the liturgy is the source and summit of our investment as our uh, Christian walk, uh, it's the summit toward which all the activity of the word church is directed, and it is the font from which flow all of the graces and blessings that God so wants us to have. So the power comes from the liturgy, and it's a privileged place for uh, participating uh, with God. Liturgical catechesis aims to initiate people into the mystery of Christ, because truly he is mystery. And there's an appropriate name to the follow-up sessions to our RCIA programs the rite of Christian initiation of adults. And after these people come in and they hear the treasures and the teachings of the church and their neophytes with regard to their participation, we don't drop them. What we do is we then carry them forward in this room, in this uh, room of teaching called mystagogy. And that's to kind of help them along their embracing of the mystery of Jesus Christ. And they love it. And so then we continue the journey. We've catechized them. They have accepted and said, I believe and confess all that the church teaches is true. And then we continue that walk with them because it truly is a mystery. And so it's called the mystagogy, the mystery of Jesus Christ. How does that happen in the liturgy? Well, in the liturgy, the movement is from the visible to the invisible. And that's why the Catholic Church is so rich in sacramentals. Just looking around this beautiful chapel that we have here, they have a crucifix reminding us of the greatest act of love and obedience of the God-man Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, and then all the images that are around me, just candles and incense. And so we move from the visible and the sensory to the invisible so that we can come closer to the mystery of God. We move from the sign to the thing, to the thing signified. For example, the light. The light of Christ came into the world. That's a sign of Jesus, who is forever the light of the world. And then we move from the sacraments, the visible sign of the invisible reality of God's love and mercy to the mystery of God's love and mercy that we can appropriate in ourselves and in our souls. We refer to the birthday of the church as the day of Pentecost, the birthday of the church. That's the day that the church was made manifest to the world. 
And we have this image, if you have some catechization, all the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Artists have done a beautiful job of showing the tongues of fire come raining down on the heads of the apostles and Blessed Mother Mary. And the outpouring of the Holy Spirit took place that day. And so that was God's way of dispensing the mystery. Okay, now we would refer to the birthday of the church as the day of Pentecost. And artists have done a beautiful uh, rendition of this, so many of them showing the tongues of fire that come raining down out of the heads of the apostles and of Blessed Mother Mary. And so that would be called the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That is the day that the church was made manifest to the world and that the dispensation of God's mystery was now out there, that God's Holy Spirit was now in the world and available to all those who would partake of it. In the age of the church, Christ continues to live. He is not with us in the flesh. He in, reigns in heaven, but his Holy Spirit that he so happily sent to us is here in the world. And where is it most particularly? It's in the church. So Christ continues to live and act with us, his brothers and sisters, in his church. How does he do that? He does that through the sacraments. The sacraments are the extension of the presence and the power of Jesus Christ. We call the sacramental economy we call that the dispensation of the fruits of Christ's Paschal Mystery. All the fruits that he accomplished there, the redemption and the gifts that are part of that, uh, we have contact with that and we have access to that through the sacraments of the church. And so if the economy is the plan of God, we would say the sacramental economy is the saving work of God available to us through the sacraments. And there's a beautiful reference to this in Scripture. It's in Ephesians where we read, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, to be holy and without blemish before him. He destined us before him in love to be his sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he freely bestowed upon us in the beloved. In all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will in accord with his favor that he set forth in him as a plan for the fullness of times to sum up all things in Christ, in heaven and on earth. How beautiful the verbiage here from Paul and it's, it's just beautiful the fact that the mystery was made known to us through Jesus Christ, the mystery of God's plan. And uh, in what way, we might ask, is the Father the source and the goal of the, of the liturgy? Well, from the beginning of time until now, God's whole work is a blessing. We would say that everything is a blessing. Uh, Augustine used to say, it's all grace. It's all grace. And it is. God blesses us in so many ways. In order for us to thank God for all of his blessings, we'd have to be infinite as he is. And that's why he made us infinite, so that we could forever praise him and bless him and thank him in heaven. And there's beautiful verbiage in our catechism. It says, from the beginning, God blessed all living beings, especially man and woman. Even after sin, in covenant with Noah through history of the chosen people, divine blessings were communicated and responded to by the descendants of Abraham. In the church's liturgy, the divine blessing is revealed and communicated. Father is acknowledged as the source and the end of all blessings of creation and of salvation through his word. And that's why all of our prayers through are directed to the Father through Jesus Christ, who is the word made flesh. Jesus died and rose for us. He fills us with his blessings and through the word pours into our heart the gift that contains all gifts, his Holy Spirit. You know what I tell my people is, uh, our prayers, they say, Father, I struggle with prayer. And I say, gosh, you know, if you just had two dimensions to your prayer, it's just gratitude and then requesting. If all you did all day long was thank God for every blessing that you were aware of and then beg God for every help and healing that you need, that would be prayer. And that's exactly the dual dimension of the liturgy. The church's response is a response of faith and love to the blessings that we recognize and cherish that God pours upon us. And then it's the request of the church for more gifts from God to guide us and guard us still through this desert, through this pilgrimage to the kingdom of heaven. 
And so gratitude and blessing are really encompass uh, two powerful dimensions of the uh, liturgy. So what is the work of Christ in the liturgy? In the liturgy, it is principally Christ's paschal mystery that he signifies and makes presence. You know, and this is so different from historical events. The whole world is recording historical events, and so many of them, they, they happen once. And then people talk about them, they take pictures and they remember them and so forth, but it's a one type, one stop, an incident or event, and then that's it. But the paschal mystery of Christ lives on because God is eternal, God operates outside of space and time, and so his great act of love, his paschal mystery, his death, resurrection, ascension, and sending of the Spirit lives forever. It is eternal. The word eternal means ever-present. And so that once and once for all act that God accomplished on Calvary, it is not just history, it is ever-present. In fact, right now in Revelation, Jesus is seen ministering before the Father as a lamb standing as though slain. And so he's taken his glorified resurrected bodies with the wounds and he is right now before the Father ministering on our behalf. He is the lamb standing as though slain before the Father. And so his great work done once on Calvary 2,000 years ago lives on. It is an eternal sacrifice and we participate in that eternal sacrifice every time we gather for the liturgy. There's a saying in Hebrew several times. It says he did that once for all. And so many people change that and they say that Jesus did that once and for all. That's not what is said in scripture. Once and for all gives the impression that it is over, done, past, it's closed. Once and for all, we say that a lot. If I told you once, once and for all, that's it. But here again, he did it once for all. And that opens the door to the fact that that is a once uh, uh, confected uh, sacrifice on Calvary that is an eternal sacrifice. It did an end there. It goes on and on and on. He died and suffered for all men, and we participate in that through the ages, through the generations, at transcending time. It's real. It lives. It goes on. What is Christ's participation? Well, it, from the time of the church that we just talked about at Pentecost, what he did is he then sent those apostles out into the world to bring his power and his presence to a hurting world. It says that at the Last Supper, he told them, he said, do this in memory of me. So he gave instructions to his 12 to go out and do what he had just done. He had a holy meal with them where he took unleavened bread and wine and he transubstantiated them. We would say he transformed them into his body and blood. And then he said, do this in memory of me. Take me my sacramental presence out to a hurting world and feed them. And then at the end of John's Gospel, it says he appeared to the twelve in the upper room and he breathed on them. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. And what did he do? He gave them the power to forgive. He said, the sins you forgive are forgiven and the sins you hold bound are hold bound. And so Jesus was sent by the Father and then he sent the apostles to us and he sent them to feed and to forgive to feed and forgive the flock. So God has entrusted great power. Who can forgive sins but God? And Jesus gave that power to forgive sins and to confect the sacrament to the apostles. And that very power for those men is still in the presence of the world this day. And it's here because of what we call apostolic succession. And so Jesus knew that those 12 would die after he had given them the power. And he came for all men and women for all time. And so he knew that the power would be handed on in what is called the laying on of hands. In scripture, for example, in Paul's letter to Timothy and Titus, those are bishops. And it says in there where he laid his hands on them and he gave them the power of ministry of the ministerial priesthood. So that's been going on now for 2,000 years. I was ordained by Bishop Foley in the Diocese of Birmingham. He was ordained by a bishop who was ordained by a bishop all the way back to Peter and the 12 apostles. And we call that apostolic succession, that the power invested in them by Jesus the Lord has been carefully and methodically handed on from generation to generation to this present age and until he comes again. So it's apostolic succession. It's accomplished in a sacrament. It's called the sacrament of holy orders. 
And it's truly present this day, and thank goodness it is. There's great power that God wants us to have access to. And then also, uh, Christ's work is present in earthly things. For example, in the sacrifice of the Mass. And in the sacrifice of the Mass, we have the Eucharistic species, we have unleavened bread, and we have wine. And it's so God is so wise, you know, He took the thing that is so natural to us, feeding ourselves. Little babies, they don't know anything and they know how to eat. And so He took the thing that's so natural, uh, feeding ourselves, so that we could feed on Him. And so through the Eucharistic species, we have the power and presence of God in us. He loves us so much. He doesn't just want relationship, you know, walk by my side. He wants union. And the union comes in holy communion. And that's where we participate in the liturgy such that we can then participate in receiving Jesus uh, through his true presence in the sacrament of the Eucharist. So there's Jesus' participation. And what does this do? It gives us a foretaste of heaven. You know, uh, heaven is to be. Heaven is not here. Uh, there's great struggles in the world, but Jesus says, in the world you'll have problems, but don't worry, I've conquered the world. And so with that level of hope, we continue to go forward, feeding on him, his word, that is written, and his word made flesh, and the sacrament of the Eucharist, and that gives us a foretaste of what is to come. We know in our spirit and in our heart of the goodness and the consolation of the spirit when we're in union with God, this side of heaven. And it's just a little snippet of what is to be when we're in full union with God, when we're in the beatific vision and we get to see him face to face. We may ask, what is the work of the Holy Spirit in the liturgy? Well, the Holy Spirit prepares us to receive the wisdom and the way of God. Jesus uh, foretold this. He said, I will send you another, an advocate, who will guide you in all things. And so the Holy Spirit prepares us for the reception of Jesus Christ. How? Well, in the liturgy, the liturgy of the Mass, we have the Old Testament readings. And so we remember how the Holy Spirit moved those prophets and those leaders to document and to spread the Word of God. So the Old Testament readings, the praying of the Psalms. The Psalms were written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus himself prayed the Psalms. And we participate in those beautiful prayers in the context of the liturgy. And above all, it's recalling the saving events of the fulfillment of our redemption, of salvation. And so we would say that in the mystery of the Mass, that there are typological kind of indications. We would say there are many types that God gave us in the Old Testament that reveal uh, what he wanted us to know in the New. Augustine had a great saying. He said, in the Old Testament, the New Testament is concealed. And in the New Testament, the Old Testament is revealed. And we see so many types of what God, he had to spoon feed us along the way so that we could kind of appropriate his plan. And so this comes forward by having both the Old Testament readings in Scripture uh, in, the, in the Mass and then the New Testament readings. What we have is we have the promise that God gave us and then we have the fulfillment of the promise. And we get to remind ourselves of this every time we pray the liturgy. We remind us ourselves of God's plan and God's promise. And the Holy Spirit, primarily in the Eucharist, calls us to remember the mystery of our salvation. And this is so powerful. He calls us through a couple of different dimensions that are in the Mass. And one is anamnesis. It's a big word. It's a Greek word. And it refers to remembering. Remembering. Anamnesis. Calling to mind God's saving work all through history. How many times he saved his chosen people from obliteration but then how he saves us as we go forward. And so we hear this in the Word of God and, uh, and in, the, in the Word made flesh. And so the anamnesis is part of the liturgy that we celebrate where we call to mind God's saving work, especially the work at the Last Supper where he gave himself to us in the flesh. And the Holy Spirit makes present the mystery of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit comes into the liturgy in what we call the epiclesis, Another big word. And when you say, see the priest put his hands out like this in the context of the liturgy, he is calling down the Holy Spirit upon the simple elements of bread and wine so that they can be transubstantiated into the fullness of Jesus Christ. The laying on of hands is kind of a sacred gesture. The coming of the Holy Spirit, it's so uh, integral and powerful aspect of the liturgy. 
And uh, when the minister takes his hands, when the priest takes his hands and holds them over the simple elements of bread and wine, he is calling down the Holy Spirit. It's a beautiful gesture. It's in scripture where we lay the hands on another person to ordain them as far as the deacon, uh, priest, or bishop. And here we're calling down God's Holy Spirit on these elements so that they be transformed, that they be transubstantiated into the body and blood, the soul and divinity of Jesus Christ. It's the heart of the sacramental celebration that this is what is taking place, something we can't see with our eyes, but that we believe because Jesus' words are efficacious. You know, at the Last Supper, when Jesus said, take and eat, this is my body, something really happened. Because God's words are just not only informative, but they're efficacious. Something happens when he speaks. When God spoke in Genesis, he said, let there be light, there was light. God spoke and his word was efficacious. When Jesus said, Lazarus, come out, Lazarus came out. God's words are efficacious. And when Jesus held the simple elements of bread and he said, this is my body, it took place. And when he took the cup with wine and he said, this is my blood, it happened, it took place. How does it happen today? By calling down God's Holy Spirit. What I tell the people is through the power of the Holy Spirit and the hands of the priest. I have nothing to do with it. I'm the instrument. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, God's power and the hands of the priest, these simple elements of bread and wine become the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus. It's the heart of the Eucharistic celebration. And it's why it's the pinnacle sacrament. And there's a great reference by St. John Damascene. And he says this, you ask, how the bread becomes the body of Christ and the wine, the blood of Christ, I shall tell you. The Holy Spirit comes upon them and accomplishes what surpasses every word and thought. Let it be enough for you to understand that it is by the Holy Spirit that the Lord, through and in himself, took flesh. The power of the Holy Spirit. We just celebrated that just earlier this week where we celebrated the Immaculate Conception. And in scripture it says, Mary asks, how is this to be that you're saying I'm going to bear God's son? I don't know man. And angel Gabriel says, the, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. Hence the child to be born will be called holy. It's the Holy Spirit at work in the world. And it is very much in the liturgy today. You know, there's a great uh, phrase that's called the communion of the Holy Spirit. It comes from the catechism. And it's so beautiful that that's now in our mass, you know, as the Liturgy, some of the greetings and the interchanges were changed about two years ago that is now the way I greet the people. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. The communion of the Holy Spirit. It's the new greeting at, at Mass. And what a beautiful thing it is. The Holy Spirit is about union. You know, when you picture the Holy Spirit, you would say, if God is the lover and Jesus is the beloved, and then the exchange of love, the eternal inferno of love that flows between the Father and Son is the Holy Spirit. It is the love itself. And so you have the Father who loves the Son and the Son loves the Father and that eternal exchange is called the Holy Spirit. It's the bond of love. And so when we say the communion of the Holy Spirit, we're talking about this beautiful charity that God is sharing with us. Every, the grace that overflows the Trinity comes down. It's called grace, the, the love that overflows the Trinity. And so we participate in the love of God when we receive the Holy Spirit and then when we share that love with one another. And that's what's so uniting. And that's what God calls us to do, is to be united in love, in charity, and in service. We now move into the sacraments of Christ. What are the sacraments and which ones are they? You know, probably in grade school, if you're my age or older, you used to learn that a sacrament is a visible sign instituted by Christ that brings grace. It's so simple. A visible sign instituted by, by Christ to bring us grace. That's how simple the definition was. And there's more complete ones, especially the one that our bishop wants us to use now. And in the catechism, the adult catechism, what he would like all of our students to know in eighth grade and everyone is that a sacrament is an efficacious sign of grace instituted by Christ, entrusted to the church, by which divine life is dispensed to us by the work of the Holy Spirit. That says it all, and I'm so happy he's endorsing that particular definition because, you know, some people say, well, where is it in the Bible? Well, Jesus Christ instituted and established all seven of the sacraments. So a sacrament is an efficacious sign of grace instituted by Christ, entrusted to the church, 
by which divine life, God's life, is dispensed to us by the work of the Holy Spirit. See, the sacraments are powers that come forth from the body of Jesus Christ. They are the actions of the Holy Spirit at work in the church, and there are seven. The Catholic Church reverences and celebrates seven sacraments, and they are this, baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. We call those the sacraments of initiation, and then penance and anointing of the sick. We call those the sacraments of rehabilitation, and then we have the sacrament of holy orders and matrimony. We would call those the sacraments of vocation. So we can break them up many different ways. That's just one grouping of the three different groupings of the seven sacraments. All of them convey the power of Jesus Christ, all seven sacraments. We, the recipients of those sacraments, receive the power of Jesus Christ. Now, one of those sacraments, we receive not just the power of Jesus Christ, we receive Jesus Christ, and that's the Holy Eucharist. And that's why we often call the Eucharist the most blessed sacrament. All seven are blessed sacraments. But when we say the most blessed sacrament, it's because in that sacrament we receive not just the power of Christ, but we receive Christ himself, his true and substantial presence. You know, there's a difference I would like to assert between a symbol and a power sign. We talk about a sacrament and we say it's a visible sign. Okay, what kind of a sign? Well, there are symbols, and there are symbols such as the American flag. That's a nice symbol. And if you're American, you may look at that in a parade and you may get goosebumps. Your heart may race. But the sign, which is the flag, didn't do that to you. What happened is because of your beliefs about being an American and looking at the flag, your heart raised and you got goosebumps. An enemy of America might look at a flag and say, um, be filled with hatred, and they'd want to tear down the flag. You know, So the flag in and of itself has no power. Red, white, and blue doesn't have any power. It's just a symbol. We would say that that's just a symbol. But there is something that's called a power sign. A power sign is a sign that is efficacious. Something actually happens. For example, these lights that are before me right now, because those lights are shining so brightly, we know that the invisible electricity is moving through the circuit in order to light those bulbs. So this is a power sign. That shows that power is flowing, an invisible power, but flowing still. And so we would say that the sacraments established and revered by the church, the seven sacraments, are power signs. Something really happens when you see them. Something really happens. And uh, in baptism, our souls are washed of the stain of sin, and in comes the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so all of the seven sacraments, we would say that they are power signs. What is the relationship of the sacraments to Christ? Christ loves us so much that he wants to touch us with his love. And I look at the uh, sacraments as channels of grace, channels of grace, unique channels of grace. And so if you have the analogy, you know, where you have, you're trying to get this quart of motor oil in your car, and you have something that's very life-giving for the life of the engine, and it needs to go there, how do you do that? You have to have a funnel. In order to get all of it in there, you have to be able to get into the orifice that's in the engine, and you use a funnel, and we call that a channel. And so, in the same way, the sacraments of the church would be the way that God gets his life-giving grace into the souls of all of us, his people, by pouring them forth into the um, sacraments. And they're all unique, all the seven sacraments. What is the link between the sacraments and the church? Well, you know, the church in and of itself is considered to be a sacrament. The church in and of itself is considered to be a visible sign of God's power, presence, and love. So it's not unusual to say that the church itself, the body of believers, the church itself, is actually a sacrament. The church has recognized the treasure that we receive from Jesus Christ, and the church is a faithful steward of the treasure, of all the gifts that he wants us to dispense. In the Catechism, it refers to the church as the dispenser of grace. How beautiful. God wants us to have grace. He started the Catholic Church. He established the Catholic Church on a rock foundation to be the dispenser of his, of his goodness, of his graces. 
And so we would say that the sacraments of the church have like a double sense. The sacraments of the church are by the church and for the church. We are the church. We are the church. Whether you're ministerial priesthood or the priesthood of believer, the grace that God wants us to have through his church is intended for us. And it's given by the church. The power to dispense it has been bestowed on the ministerial priesthood by God himself and that is meant to be used for other ministers of the priesthood and also for the common priesthood. I'd like to think that the sacraments are the extension of Christ's presence here on earth. You know, our Lord was here for 33 years. He ascended to the Father and he's no longer here visibly. But the sacraments that he left behind show us that God is with us still. So they would be extensions of God's presence here on earth. And so there are two uh, ministries. We have the ordained ministry, the ministerial priesthood, and that is the leaders, the ones who uh, dispense the graces of Jesus that he wants us to have. And the ministers stand in the place of Jesus, especially in the confessional and in the, at the altar. Our bishop has a nice saying when he goes to visit the sick, he'll stand before him and say, I know I don't look like Jesus Christ, but I'm here in his person. And what I'm going to dispense to you is his power. And so for the anointing of the sick and so forth, you know, I don't look like Jesus Christ, no priest does. But here again, you know, God assigned us and called us and ordained it such that we could be there and be a presence to the people of God's presence and to bring them comfort and to dispense the sacraments. I don't bring the grace. I bestow it because it's the work of the Holy Spirit. You may wonder, what is the sacramental character of the sacraments? Three of our uh, sacraments are repeatable. There are seven sacraments, and we would say that three of them are repeatable, which means grace upon grace can continue to be poured through that particular funnel or the, through that particular channel. And I like to make the analogy of like the lights that are here. You know, you may have a three-level light. You turn it on, and then you can go brighter and brighter. And every time you receive a sacrament, such as Holy Communion, or the Sacrament of the Anointing of the Sick, or the Sacrament of Confession, more grace is poured forth into your soul. And if you allow it, then you can go brighter and brighter in the light and the love of God. Now, there are four sacraments that you receive only once, okay? You receive Confirmation only once. You receive Baptism, the Gate Sacrament, only once. You're baptized once, you're confirmed once. And then the other ones would be of your vocation. If you're ordained a Catholic priest and Holy Orders, priest or deacon or bishop, you receive that once. And if you're married, hopefully you would receive the grace of the sacrament of matrimony one time. And so those are non-repeatable. And of the three, of the four non-repeatable sacraments, three of them have a certain character to them. We would say that on the day of our baptism, as uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord, as children of God, our soul was configured to Jesus Christ, okay? And it has a certain mark. It's like God put his thumbprint. You know, at baptism for the children, we trace the sign of the cross on their forehead. On the day of our baptism, as if we are marked out with a sacramental sign that we belong to him. And so we would say that that is an indelible mark, never to be erased and never to be repeated. And so we refer to that as the sacramental character of the gift of baptism, of the sacrament of baptism. It remains forever in a Christian as a positive disposition of the grace of God that now resides. We move from being a creature of God to being a child of God. We're adopted, and that never is to change. And similarly, in the sacrament of confirmation, when we receive the full outpouring of God's Holy Spirit, that too leaves an indelible mark on the soul, and also it is non-repeatable and non-removable. And then finally, should a man be ordained a priest? When a priest is ordained, he receives a special character. He is configured to Christ, the head. All of the faithful are configured to Christ in baptism, but we are configured to Christ, the head. So we act in his place while he's not here to lead and feed the people. And again, uh, that is an indelible mark on our soul. It is never to be repeated and never to be removed. And now we move into what is the relationship between the sacraments and the faith. And 
the purpose of the sacraments given in the uh, uh, catechism is this, to sanctify men, to build up the body of Christ, and to give worship to God. And they presuppose certain things. They presuppose that there are certain words and symbols that are used, objects that nourish and strengthen and, and express what we want to do. There's a saying from the apostles, lex orandi and lex credenti. And that means that the church believes as she prays. The church believes as she prays. And so there are certain rites and rituals that we celebrate in the church, and they are not to be modified to any great degree or manipulated at the will of the minister. Uh, they are to be set, and uh, there is a great um, solace in that, that on a worldwide basis we're all celebrating in the same united, uh, unified way. What are the reasons for the sacraments? What are, for what reasons are the sacraments necessary uh, for salvation? Certainly, um, the gate sacrament is the gift of baptism where we're brought into God's holy family. And uh, we would say that these sacraments, that they are efficacious and that they signify something that's happening that we cannot see, to the soul that we cannot see. So they confer grace. And we would say that they confer the grace that they signify. Those are beautiful words. And here's what it means. For example, in the great sacrament of baptism, we use the gift of water. Water, why do we use water? We use water for two reasons. We use water to cleanse, and we use water to nourish. We wash our face, we wash our clothes, we wash our car. We also uh, water our lawn, we water ourselves, we hydrate ourselves, and we you know, give plants and all that uh, nourishment with water. And so, water is used to demonstrate, the sign demonstrates what's happening to the soul. Number one, we're washing the soul of original sin if it's an infant. If it's an adult that has actual sin, it's also washed away. And so the, the sacrament confers the grace that is signified. Baptism cleanses. It cleanses the sin from the soul and it nourishes. Because once our soul is clean and original sin is removed, then in comes God's Holy Spirit to nourish us to life. And so that simple use of water by God's design on how we're adopted into God's family is just beautiful. It's just beautiful. The sacraments confer the grace that they signify. And here's another beautiful part of our sacramental theology is that the sacrament is efficacious because it's the work of God. It is not the work of the minister. And that means that it's independent of the holiness of the minister or the sin of the minister. So if the sacrament of baptism is bestowed by a person in grave sin, that's unrelated to the fact that the, the grace is flowing and the fruits of the uh, baptism are successful. It does not depend on the disposition of the person who is giving the sacrament. But what is important to realize is that the gifts that God gives us in these sacraments, it is related to the disposition of the receiver. How we receive it is kind of like going to determine how the grace of that sacrament blossoms in our life. If you receive Holy Communion and then walk out the door and don't give it another thought, well, you're limiting yourself with regard to how the grace of that Holy Communion is going to blossom uh, in your life. It would be, for example, if I uh, snuck up and gave you a $100 bill and put it in your purse or your back pocket, and you're walking around all day with a great gift, $100, and you don't know you have it. And so you don't rejoice in the fact that you have it, you don't talk about the fact that you have it, and you don't use it because you didn't even know you had it in your back pocket or your purse. And if you don't appropriate the graces that you're going to receive in the gift of any sacrament, baptism or Holy Communion or even confession, if you're not aware of the graces that are there, then there's no way for it to blossom and continue on as you leave that sacrament and go out to live again in the world. So you must recognize the gift. You need to rejoice in the gift, share the gift, and use the gift uh, to the glory of God and to your own benefit and happiness. The church affirms that for believers, sacraments are necessary for salvation. You may remember in scripture how Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And it's so true. And so many people try. So many people try to live apart from God, apart from Jesus Christ, 
And then they're surprised when their life falls apart and they're wrapped in confusion and, and hurt. The sacraments confer the grace of the Holy Spirit. So what we're receiving in the sacraments is supernatural help, supernatural healing, supernatural life. And so to think that, the, to, to have that statement that sacraments are necessary for salvation, that is so true. We in our humanness, by our own gifts and talents and benefits and intellect, we are not capable of uh, being the person God's designed us to be without supernatural help, to overcome temptation to sin and to live and uh, follow the will of God. And so the sacraments are necessary for salvation. It says that the fruit of the sacraments makes us faithful partakers in the divine nature. Isn't that beautiful verbiage? It's sort of like, you know, God is all holy, God is love, and for us to be with him, we must become like him. And that's what our earthly journey is all about. And if we do that well, if we become loving, that's why he always says, love God and love your neighbor. If we become love, then we're ready to be with God forever in eternity. We must become like him. Augustine said this. He said, God became man so that man might become God. God is love. Our whole life's journey should be, how do we fall in love with love and then are so drawn to do what love asks us to do that we become love and then we're ready to go right to be with him in heaven in eternity. And so that's part of the um, aspect of the sacraments and they can do that for us. They can help us. They can nourish us and they can heal us so that we're constantly moving closer and closer to that union, that union with him. You realize that the, uh, we, we talk about the sacraments being necessary for salvation and that's because in our humanness we are so unable, incapable of being loving. We come into this world how? As very selfish human beings. What does a baby want? A baby wants to be fed and changed and held and protected because it's all about the baby. And as the baby matures and gets older, the transition that hopefully takes place is they start to care and reach out to others. They become selfless instead of selfish. And so for us to do that, we need God's help. We need supernatural help. And when we allow God to help us, the help that we get is coming from the lover. God is pure love. God is the good giver. And so in order to be with him forever in heaven, we must become like him. We must reflect him and uh, reflect him. And so the way we do that is we need to become love itself. And the way we do that is by being fed and being healed and being fed and being healed along the way with supernatural help, which is God, his Holy Spirit, until we become uh, lovers like him, selfless lovers, self-giving love and then we're ready to be with God forever in heaven. St. Augustine had a great saying. He said that uh, God became man so that man might become God. And at first we're kind of horrified in this. That's like, oh, we can't become God and that's a, we should never even think that. Well, God wants us to think that. Jesus said in, at the uh, uh, time where he talked about we must eat his flesh and drink his blood, he says, you know, if we feed on him, then we will become like him. And that's what we do when we receive Holy Communion. We become godlike in our ability to love. And that's necessary for the kingdom of heaven. What is the relationship between these sacraments and everlasting life? If the sacraments are the power and the presence of Almighty God, then they are a foretaste of heaven. And so the relationship is that the, the more that we receive them, the more that we're going to be drawn to that day where we, was, we actually be uh, not people of hope, but we'll be people of present with Almighty God. Right now we're people of hope because we're hoping to be with what we can't see. But the day will come where uh, we'll be with love itself. And um, that's the connection here between the, um, the sacraments and everlasting life. They give us this little foretaste. They whet our appetite. They draw us. They call us to continue to stay united with God this side of heaven so that we can be with them eternally in heaven. As we talk about the liturgy, the sacred liturgy, the holy liturgy, we may wonder, you know, Who's there? Who is present? How do we celebrate the liturgy? When we gather together, is it just the people that are in the church with us or are there more? 
And the great mystery that we believe is that we are actually entering into the heavenly liturgy. When I, as priest, walk down the main aisle of the church at the beginning of Mass, in the liturgy of the Mass, and we have the cross bearer, and we have the candle bearers, and we have the book bearer, and we have the incense, and we're walking up, we're actually, what it is, is we're actually approaching the heavenly, the heavenly realm. And that's really why the priest and the ministers dress in the garments that they do, is what we're doing is we're covering up our earthly garments and addressing ourselves in the royal robes that will be reflective of being in heaven. And so we go up that main aisle, and then we go into the sanctuary, which is the Holy of Holies, and we're getting close to the tabernacle, and we get close to the altar where the sacrifice will take place again and again, the representation of the once-for-all sacrifice. It's like we're leaving the world behind, but we're still part of this community, and then we're also entering into the heavenly liturgy. So who are we celebrating with in the context of the Mass? Heaven itself. And it's worded so beautifully in the Catechism. The Catechism says this, the celebrants of the heavenly liturgy, recapitulated in Christ, these are the ones who take part in the service of the praise of God and the fulfillment of his plan, the heavenly powers, all creation symbolized by the four living beings, the servants of the old and new covenants symbolized by the 24 elders, you had the 12 tribes of Israel and then you had the 12 apostles, the new people of God symbolized by the 144,000, especially the martyrs, all those who were slain for their love for the word of God, and the all-holy mother of God, the woman referred to in scripture, the bride of the lamb, which is us, which is the church, the great multitude, which no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and tongues. Wow, wow. All the angels, all the saints, everyone is present there at this liturgy. We can't see them. But here again, that puts another whole celebration in solemnity. It's like um, we're, aga we're, august, um, we're aghast at how it could be so immense, how it could be so incredible that what we're entering into to celebrate there is so beautiful and so rich and so far-reaching. This is the eternal liturgy. And so who's at the liturgy? You have all the celebrants of the heavenly liturgy, and then you have those of the earthly liturgy. And the catechism would say the whole community, the body of Christ united with the head, at that moment, the priest stands as Christ the head, and then all of the uh, faithful, the common priesthood, are there to be united. And this really jives well with our, our theology, our belief in the communion of saints. And so we are in touch, we are in relationship with the souls in heaven, we call the souls in heaven the church triumphant, the church glorified, and then we have the church militant, we're the souls here, we're marching, militant, we're kind of on the journey to the kingdom of heaven, and we're united in a special way in the liturgy of the mass. We are praising God together. Our voices are united in praise of the Father through the Son in the liturgy of the Eucharist. There are ordinary ministers, what we would say, and that would be myself, a bishop or a deacon, we're the ordinary minister of the sacred liturgy. And then the church allows extraordinary ministers, extraordinary ministers, and these are lay people who have been trained and approved to participate in the liturgy, to dispense Holy Communion, to visit the sick and, and things such as that. And then you have the lay faithful. And the lay faithful participate in this beautiful liturgy by being readers, by being uh, other ministers that are their choir members, commentators, servers, and so forth. So they all exercise a unique and important role and function, and they all participate in the liturgy, and that's who is there as we celebrate. How is the liturgy celebrated? Well, there's a great interweaving of signs and symbols as well as words and actions. And we'll talk just a moment on the signs and the symbols. We would say that their meaning is rooted in the work of creation and human culture. First you have the Old Covenant, and then you have what's fully revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. And there are many signs and symbols that are at work. First of all, you have the signs of the human world. And the reason that signs are so important in the liturgy is because God has made us as sensory human beings. And we have our five senses. We have the sense of sight, and hearing, and smell, and touch, and speech. And so to utilize all of our senses in the celebration of the liturgy makes us kind of fully alive and fully participatory and uh, receiving of all that is there, the experience 
of the unseen. And so first of all, we have the signs of the world and then the signs of the covenant. But the signs always occupy a very important place in our livelihood and our language, our gesture, our actions, and things such as this. And so how does God speak to us in the visible creation? You know, we have the nature, we have the elements of creation, we have the wind and the rain and water and light and darkness. We have the, all those type of dimensions. And uh, so God speaks to us through those, and we hear about those in his word and how in the Old Testament, uh, God guided his people through uh, the human world uh, to draw closer and closer to him. And then we have the signs of the covenant. You know, how did God bond himself to his people? God says so many times in scripture, I will be your God and you will be my people. And the way that he kind of brought that together is by sacred signs. And God never really talked about union with his people as a contract. God always spoke of his union with his people as a covenant over 300 times in scripture. God wants to be united with us in a covenant bond that is a holy, sacred family bond that he unites himself with us. And we saw so many examples of that. You know, the circumcision, you know, with Abraham in order to be in the family, circumcision was the sign of the covenant. And then we have anointing and consecrating of kings. We have the laying on of hands. We have the sacrifices. And above all, the Passover, where the church sees in these signs the prefiguring of the new covenant, the Passover of Moses, that Jesus would, would celebrate there as he uh, gave his life for the life of the world. You have signs taken up by Christ, and uh, Jesus was big on signs, you know, and all of his healings. He would put his finger in their ears, or he would spit on their tongue, or, you know, he would raise them up if they were sick and uh, walk on water. He did, and Peter started to sink, and he lifted them up. And so just the gestures and the contact that our Lord had uh, demonstrate uh, the physicality of what's taking place here. And then since Pentecost, it is through these signs that the Holy Spirit carries out uh, the work of his sanctification. The other dimension here of how the liturgy is celebrated would be in words and in actions. You know, the sacramental celebration is the meeting of God's children with their Father in Christ, and the Holy Spirit takes the form of a dialogue. And the new liturgy, you know, since the 1960s is so beautiful because no longer is it like could be considered the priest prayer where the people are kind of outside of that. Now there's this real engagement. So many times, the Lord be with you and with your spirit. And there's this dialogue that takes place even in the celebration of the Holy Liturgy. And then we have the catechesis. And the catechesis takes place to kind of guide and guard the people to understand uh, the richness that is here and as I said before, the mystagogy, which is the follow-up session in the RCIA program, um, helps them come in touch with the invisible, for the visible to be uh, a sign of the invisible and the sign to be a sign of the things sanctified. Okay. You know, another dimension of how the liturgy is, separate, se is celebrated actually comes through in the words and the actions that are used. And, uh, in the Mass as it is now, it's so beautiful that we have the interchange between the priest and the congregation. The priest will say, the Lord be with you, and the congregation will say, and with your spirit. And so it's this coming back and forth, it's this interchange that is so holy and so participatory so the people are totally engaged. How are they engaged, though? They're engaged in a very reverent way. The people that choose to come into the Catholic Church after being in other churches, one of the things they many times say is, I love the reverence. I love the reverence for what is in your holy house. And it's apparent in the words that are used, uh, the rhetoric that we use, the beautiful wording of our prayers. It's uh, visible in the gestures that are there, you know, how profound the bowing and the genuflecting and the care that we use when we are around the altar. And in the silence, in the things we don't say. To walk into a church where no one's talking and to know that that is something is special going on. It's like walking in the library. People are trying to study. And you walk into church and you say, hmm, people are trying to pray. And so there's a great reverence that's part of this whole area of uh, words and actions. And uh, like after the communion, Holy Communion is distributed, we like to have a moment of meditation and just that hush, that silence, and knowing that all the people are trying to thank God and approach God now that he's truly with them in the Holy Eucharist is so beautiful. The way that we venerate the lectionary, the way we kiss the page after reading the gospel, that we have done that, it's just like, wow, that there is something very special and something very holy here. On our special liturgies where we have incense, and we have the incense to mark out the holy, 
And then we have the incense where the perfume is rafting up to heaven and we pray that our prayers will approach heaven the same way. That there's such great, uh, great symbolism there and we try to approach the unseen with the seen through the senses. There is majesty and mystery. Two other areas there that are part of the liturgy would be the singing and the music. And uh, through the ages, there's been very sacred holy words that are put together that can just give great glory to God. And uh, I like to think that the music lifts the liturgy to a high level of expression, just a beautiful level, a new level of beauty and magnificence. Uh, St. Augustine had the saying, he said, whoever sings prays twice and is truly uh, experienced as being doubly glorious when we have music and uh, song uh, to lift our liturgy to a new level of glory. And then finally would be the holy images that are part of the liturgy. And uh, the sacred image, um, principally those that represent Christ. In every Catholic church we have the crucifix, which is an image of our Lord on the cross, and uh, the greatest expression of the love of God and uh, the obedience of God. And so it's a, it's a very sacred image. And, there's a great uh, quote here by St. John Damascene referring to this. He says, Previously God, who has neither a body nor a face, absolutely could not be represented by an image. But now that he has made himself visible in the flesh and has lived with men, I can make an image of what I have seen of God and contemplate the glory of the Lord, his face unveiled. How beautiful. I mean, whatever the face of Jesus looks like to an artist, at least we have a face and we have a body and we have the, the nearness of God who came to us in the flesh. And that's so beautiful, whether it's an icon or a painting or a statue. And previously we did not have that. So all of these uh, images there, they would uh, signify Christ and, um, and reflect and re refer to his glory. When is the liturgy celebrated? Well, the church in her wisdom has several demarcations on the liturgy. One is called the liturgical season. I would like to break it down that there are five liturgical seasons. Right now we're in the season of Advent. It's a holy season. It's three and a half to four weeks long and then we go into the season of Christmas and that's about three weeks long. It varies every year. It goes to the baptism of the Lord and so that would be two seasons, Advent, preparation for Christmas, Christmas, and then you get into a little bit of ordinary time, and then that's broken by in the February time frame where we begin the Lenten season. It's the penitential season. It's 40 days of prayer and fasting and abstinence and almsgiving and many things to prepare our souls to be closer to God. And then the great season of Easter, which is 50 days. 50 days we celebrate that from the day of the resurrection to the day of the ascension 40 days later to the day of Pentecost 10 days later. So it's a total of 50 days. And then we return to ordinary time. So when is the liturgy celebrated? Well, on the calendar of 365 days, we break it up into these five liturgical seasons. And the highest feast day of the year, of course, is the great work of Jesus in redemption. It's called Easter. It's the day of the resurrection. And the second highest feast day is the day of Christmas, which we're going to celebrate here shortly. And so those, everything else kind of falls around, preparing and celebrating those great days in the church calendar. Holy Mother Church believes that we should continue to celebrate the saving work of her divine spouse, our Lord Jesus Christ. It's as if God is saying, don't forget my son. Don't forget my son, and we don't want to. And that's why 2,000 years later, after the great act of redemption, we still remember him and two billion people still claim him as King and Lord. And we continue to love him and desire to be with him forever in heaven. And so that's how the, uh, when is it celebrated? We have this calendar here of the various liturgical seasons. And another way to look at this when we celebrate would be the Lord's Day. You know, handed on by tradition from the apostles, uh, the third commandment is to keep holy the Lord's Day, which was the Sabbath in the Old Testament. That was Saturday. And so from sundown on Friday through all of the day of Saturday was the day of the Lord. But then the apostles chose the day of the resurrection, the day of the new beginning, the day of life, to be the day of the Lord, the day that he rose from the dead. And so then since that time, we've been celebrating the day of the Lord as Sunday. And that begins at sundown on Saturday. And that's why we can have the 
anticipated mass liturgies on Saturday and no earlier than four o'clock and then all the day, all the day of Sunday, we can celebrate that to honor the third commandment of God Almighty to keep holy the Lord's day. But we in the Catholic Church take that even to a new dimension and we're reflecting on uh, Jesus' prayer that he gave us. He gave us the Lord's Prayer. And in the prayer it says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And for many of us when we say that prayer we think, Lord, take care of me and my family and let's put sustenance on the table. Give me my daily bread so I can live. But could our Lord have meant, give us this day our daily bread, meaning him. Jesus said, in John 6, he says, I am the bread come down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. Hmm. Could we participate in receiving the bread from heaven every day? We absolutely can, and many do in the Catholic Church. In the Catholic Church, we celebrate the Holy Mass every day. Every day. You would say that the Mass never ends. The last number that I heard is that around the world, on any given day, there are 364,000 Masses prayed every day. And if that's true, and if you do the Mass, the math on that, then you'll recognize that there are four Masses being prayed every second. Every second, four Masses are being prayed around the world, which means that the Mass never ends. And so we can participate. We say, when is the liturgy celebrated? Well, by God's design, in Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, God says to Malachi, that the day will come from the rising of the sun to the setting, my name is great, and everywhere the pure, spotless sacrifice is offered to my name. What is the pure, spotless sacrifice? There's only one, the Lamb of God, the man without sin. So we offer the pure, spotless sacrifice everywhere from the rising of the sun to the setting, and as the globe turns, my name is great, and everywhere the pure, spotless sacrifice is offered to my name. The day has come. What Malachi said as a prophet must come true, and it has come true in the Catholic Church, where we celebrate the Holy Liturgy, the liturgy every day. And so it gives a new meaning to the Lord's Prayer there. Give us this day our daily bread. Another way to look at how we in the Catholic Church celebrate uh, the liturgy, or when we celebrate the liturgy, we have the liturgical year, okay? Not just the season, but the liturgical year. And so on that, we kind of have a beautiful way of bringing God's holy word to bear through a Sunday a lectionary and a weekday lectionary. So on Sunday, we have a rotation where we read from the Gospel of Matthew, and then the next year, the go Gospel of Mark, and then the Gospel of Luke, and in every one of those years, we flavor it with readings from the Gospel of John. So it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then we start over, Matthew, Mark, Luke. We just entered into a new year where we read mostly, predominantly from Matthew. It's year two of the Sunday cycle. And on the weekday, we just have two lectionaries. We have the odd and even. So last, last this year of 2014, which is now we're into the new liturgical year of 2015 with an odd year. So we have those two compilations of scripture. And if you went to Holy Mass every day for three years, you would have heard proclaimed 98% of God's word in the Bible. Because of the way the church has put together the scripture passages to meld with the gospels, you would have heard 98% of the revealed Word of God, which is huge. And so we take the liturgical year and we mark it out with regard to a lectionary for Sunday and a lectionary for the weekdays, and we accomplish really presenting to the people and contemplating all of, uh, all of God's Holy Word. And the last dimension here, one of the last dimensions of the liturgy that we celebrate in the Mass would be the sanctoral uh, liturgy, the word meaning holy. And so we in the church, we reverence those men and women who have gone before us that are the saints, that we declare saints in heaven. We didn't make them saints in heaven. God made them saints. But we honor them for their heroic virtue and their godly lives, and we hold them as, up as models. And everybody knows St. Francis of Assisi and St. Patrick and St. Michael. And so on a different day of the year, the church kind of puts the different men and women there as models where we can, in a, in a unique way, uh, kind of celebrate them. All of us have a birthday, and we don't celebrate our birthday every day, we celebrate our birthday on our birthday. And so, although we celebrate Mass every day, it's kind of nice to have these occasions where we can celebrate some of the men and women who have gone before us. 
And then two, the church wants us to not forget some of the real foundational truths that may not um, be celebrated on a Sunday. For example, Christmas. Christmas this year falls on a Thursday. It is an important day. It's a very important day. We celebrate the birth of the Redeemer of the world. And there are churches in this community that will not gather because it's not on a Sunday. Well, the church in her wisdom says, well, there's five feast days that are called holy days of obligation, which means we as church are calling you, the faithful, to gather, even though it's not a Sunday, so that we never forget the truth and the treasure of that particular occasion, like Christmas. How can we forget Christmas? And so we will, we'll gather, and we just celebrated last Monday the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. So we gathered on a Monday so that we would not forget the good work of God in creating a woman who was free from the stain of original sin. Such great wisdom. And so um, for those five days we gathered together in church, regardless of when the day falls on the, on the weekly calendar. The church has a way, a beautiful way, of extending the liturgy of the Mass. And the way that is extended, one of the ways, is called the Liturgy of the Hours. And that's where all people, especially the priests and the sisters and the deacons and the bishops, we make promises that we will read the Liturgy of the Hours every day. And then the faithful, they can choose to do that. And it's a beautiful way to extend the liturgy. We would call it the Liturgy of the Hours or the Divine Office. And it is really a public prayer of the church. Okay? And um, all of us are baptized into the priesthood of Jesus Christ, priest, prophet, and king. And so all can use this vehicle of prayer to celebrate um, the God's love. And so what it does, by praying the Liturgy of the Hours, you know there's several dimensions to this where we're, we're required to have morning prayer and then do the readings, the divine readings, and then do evening prayer, and then there's night prayer, then there's mid-morning and mid-afternoon. But there's different points in the day where we pause for 10 minutes or 15 minutes and we unite ourselves with prayer. And the beautiful part of this is it unites the whole world. So the very prayers that are prayed at any point are being prayed by every minister all over the world, the very same prayers. And they all include the Psalms. So of the 150 Psalms, we're praying the Psalms over and over again and the very prayers that our Lord, our Lord prayed. A very uniting prayer. It sanctifies and it transforms the whole day to pray the liturgy and the hours. And a special blessing is that we get to read from some of the church fathers and spiritual masters that are put in there too. So the church has kind of organized it all through uh, for every day so that we can be in union and extend the liturgy, the divine liturgy, and the liturgy of the hours. And now the question might be, where is the liturgy celebrated? And the liturgy is most customarily celebrated in the church. That's the house of God. And many of the churches, the Catholic churches, are magnificently decorated just to express the majesty and the dignity and the, uh, the otherness that God is. But the Mass can be celebrated anywhere. It actually can. You know, we have our guys in combat overseas, and some of the priests that are over there ministering to them, they can celebrate the liturgy on the hood of a jeep. I remember my dad saying that they celebrated it on the fender of a tank. If you're in those situations, then that's what you have to do, and you can celebrate it. I've heard of priests that were captured and they were in prison and they celebrated the divine liturgy in their prison cell. If they were able to get a hold of a piece of bread and a little bit of wine, they could celebrate that in their prison cell. So that gives a lot of flexibility. How does that compare to Old Testament times? In the Old Testament times, in the chosen people in the Holy Land, they all had to make their trip to uh, Jerusalem to celebrate at the temple in order to really uh, be able to celebrate God's love and offer their sacrifice, especially at the Passover. And so with the trashing of the uh, temple in the year 70 AD, they gave a definitive ending to requiring that people go to one spot on earth to celebrate a sacrifice to God. And it opened up that the liturgy, the celebration, uh, can be uh, dispensed and dispersed all over the world. And it's so beautiful. So it's not tied, the celebration of the liturgy is not tied to any particular one place because the body of the risen Christ is the temple. The temple in Jerusalem is gone, but the temple now is the body of Jesus Christ. And uh, he is the spiritual temple. And so wherever he is, is where we gather, where we gather to worship. 
Now, visible structures make that so appealing, and it's a, it's a, it's a safe and holy way to gather on Sunday to be able to go to church and to go into an enclosure. Uh, some of the ones that we have in our neighborhood, there are storefronts, and some people that start out very small. They start in gymnasiums and so forth. So, is it a holy place to gather? Yes, but to have a permanent location is so beautiful. And that's why those locations in Europe are so profound. They built those churches with like six courses of brick because they were never going to come down. They were never going to change. That's God's house. We're going to live here. We're going to live here forever. And the permanence of that is so beautiful. So it's beautif be beautiful to have a beautiful church. But here again, the structure is an uh, amplification of what is required. It is a house of prayer. And... Uh, that really would be the place where the Catholic Church calls us to gather and celebrate. We run into this with weddings, you know, the common, uh, not the common, but the current uh, in vogue is to have a destination wedding. Oh, we're going to get married on the beach, or we're going to get married here on the ranch or something. It's like the church says, no, if you're having a Catholic wedding, you will be married in God's house. And what I tell the people at weddings is because this reminds us that in this great union that you've just affected here by your I do is that you have these people and God to help you to go forward. And so there's no question that the house of God reminds us that God is with us. He's with us right now in the tabernacle and he's with us, uh, he's around us all the time. And then we're reminded that he is a dimension of everything, of a marriage, of an ordination, and so forth. And so typically, uh, where is the liturgy celebrated? It would be celebrated in a church, in a church that has an altar, a consecrated altar, that means it is set aside for nothing else. We don't eat lunch. We just, this is where we confect the sacrament of the Eucharist, and that's consecrated for, for that specific purpose. And we assemble uh, and we go forward. Now, what are some, uh, what is uh, the liturgical traditions and Catholicity? Um, you may know that under the Catholic Church, there are 22 churches that are under the Pope. Uh, we are the Latin Rite, we're the Roman Rite. But then there are some Eastern rites. Uh, we have uh, St. Elias here, which is the Marianite rite in our very city. And then we have the Melkite rite, St. George. And so there's, those are little different uh, traditions, uh, some different languages and some different uh, rituals that they incorporate, but they're all under the Holy Father, the Pope. And so uh, there is a little bit of difference, but it's a holy difference and it's an approved difference. We would say that it's the same, but different. Okay, it's the same Eucharist and they use the same Bible and it's the same re readings and uh, they celebrate the same ordination rites. And so one question may be, why is the one mystery of Christ celebrated according to various liturgical traditions? And I guess we would say that you know, the church is worldwide, and that's what the word Catholic means. The word Catholic means universal, universal. And to have a, any entity that's global, you're wrapping in there all kinds of cultures and tongues and ceremonies and traditions and all of that. And is it okay to reverence some of those? Absolutely. Um, some people have much more music, and some people have much more solemnness, and some people are more celebratory, and some are more toned down. It can all be honored and it can all be appreciated, and it can all be shared. And what the church is saying is that, yeah, we can uh, allow that in the celebration of the Holy Liturgy. The mystery of Christ is so rich that it cannot be exhausted in its expression by a single liturgical tradition. And so, as diverse as this world is, you will find a diverse compilation of the celebrations that are there. The church is Catholic, and so it's capable of integrating all these different diverse um, expressions into the same uh, Eucharistic ritual. Is everything unchangeable in the liturgy? Well, let's begin with a quotation from our Holy Father of happy memory, St. John Paul the Great. He said this, In the liturgy, above all, that of the sacraments, there is an immutable part a part that is divinely instituted and of which the church is the guardian, and parts that can be changed, which the church has the power and on occasion also the duty to adapt to the cultures of recently evangelized peoples. Wow, it's so beautiful. 
And so it means that there are parts of the liturgy that are unchangeable and there is no allowance for any particular priest or minister to go ahead and change wordings or such. But there is a, a part that is changeable and with the permission of the, uh, of the bishop, then there are things such as music or uh, spontaneity and celebration and gestures and dance. Those things are changeable to adapt to the cultures of the people who are trying to gather for celebration. I think that's healthy, I think it's holy, but it doesn't take apart the part that is divinely instituted in any of the seven sacraments. So what is the one criterion that assures the unity in the midst of plurality? What is it? What is the one criterion? And it's fidelity to the apostolic tradition. We would say that we have sacred scripture and sacred tradition. So we have apostolic tradition. And if something is in union with that, then it would be okay. That's the criterion to determine if something is acceptable from the standpoint of trying to blend in a plurality of cultures, conversations, and, and communions. And so what we would say is that fidelity to the apostolic tradition, the communion in the faith and sacraments received from the apostles is the criterion that assures unity amidst the diversity of liturgical traditions, a communion both signified and guaranteed by apostolic succession.